and we are going to talk about redistribution. So uh, the title of the panel is Who is going to put the bill? Fiscal union and attitude towards redistribution. Um, we have actually have four speakers, so I'd like to ask you all to uh, keep it relatively brief after uh, 15 minutes again, and then we'll have some time for uh, Q&A. So let me start with, uh, I'm actually going to skip the alphabetical order, but uh, it might be more fitting to start with uh, George Agulados, who's going to give us some more general context. Uh, George is a professor of European politics and economy at the, at the Athens University of Economic and Business. And he's also a senior fellow uh, at uh, uh, the, the Green Pink Tech. So, George. Thank you very much, uh, Nikita. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. I've spent uh, a lot of uh, the last uh, three years uh, speaking about the crisis uh, in the Eurozone context, both uh, from its, uh, as a Greek crisis and as a Eurozone crisis. And I feel a bit like a parasite uh, of uh, our mischief. But I only need to, need to look at my tax statement every year to get rid of any guilt that might be resulting from that. And uh, it is quite tempting to view the crisis uh, from a national standpoint as something that is unique for Greece and as something that befell the Greek uh, people or Greek society only as a result of our own failures. And in as much that is, uh, is tempting, it is not well grounded because this was a crisis that was both national and heavily systemic. And um, I would like to point to lay out uh, some of the systemic dimensions of this crisis before I go to the redistribution question and the fiscal uh, union question. So uh, starting from the question what went wrong. Now I would summarize it as three things and there are more than three but the three things that went wrong was that rules, fiscal rules were not applied, good times were not used to reduce public debt, and microeconomic imbalances were ignored. With regard to the first, we knew that the EMU was, uh, first of all, a fiscal union. Uh, and it was not a fiscal union, rather. It was a, a monetary union with fiscal rules. All that it had in terms of fiscal policy was fiscal rules. And yet these rules were not uh, adhered to, and they were not adhered to largely, mostly, as a result of national government irresponsibility and a lack of domestic political demand for uh, fiscal discipline, but also quite significantly uh, as a result of responsibility on the part of the Commission for not adhering, for not imposing adherence to these rules. Now, I say that with a grain of salt because the Commission was not given the authority to override national authorities and the Eurostat was not given the authority to override national statistical authorities. So this was very much a result of the uh, entire uh, architecture and the division of labor within the Eurozone. And yet, what we do know was that countries with large budget deficits were allowed to, uh, to carry on. Uh, and most importantly, this is, not, this is just one small part of it, most importantly, the, the logic behind the fiscal rules themselves, which was fiscal sustainability, debt sustainability, was ignored. Uh, and the most indicative aspect of that was the fact that, for example, the Greek economy was an economy that enjoyed a growth rate uh, which was the largest in the EMU uh, between the mid-90s and 2008. And from the beginning of that process to the end of that process, the public debt was slightly lower, or in fact it was around the same level uh, where, where it was when it started. Uh, and the failure to take advantage of an environment of high growth, of an average of 3.54% and low interest rates uh, in order to move to a um, uh, much lower public debt to GDP ratio is a failure of national governance, but it's also a failure of Eurozone and European level governance. Uh, so this is as much as fiscal sustainability was involved. And the third was that macroeconomic imbalances were ignored. The crisis that uh, erupted in 2010 was in fact a crisis that had started back in 2008 and unfolded through 2009. It was a crisis that started as a financial crisis, as a global financial crisis. 
it, uh, through the mechanisms of global financial contagion, it crossed the Atlantic and affected the European financial system. It prompted um, a process of, of uh, deleveraging in the European financial system, and it revealed the glaring uh, inadequacy of financial, of consolidated financial sector supervision at the Eurozone level. Because what we had in the Eurozone, and in the European Union in general, was a single banking and financial market, but we did not have a consolidated uh, financial supervision, and banking sector supervision. And that was one of the great reasons uh, behind this crisis. The flows of liquidity, uh, which were the result of a single currency, went massively from the core countries to the peripheral countries. Uh, banking systems and financial systems in the periphery accumulated huge risks, um, which resulted, or rather were uh, demonstrated, were, were revealed in the bubbles that we saw in financial sector and real estate bubbles in countries like Ireland or Spain. And uh, these current account deficits in the peripheral countries were the mirror image of the current account surpluses in the core countries. And through the single currency, the, the entire Eurozone grew, and this is a, a very bold generalization, but I would say the core countries grew through other exports, that is, through a, a pretty sustainable and healthy way, uh, though at a far greater extent than would be sustainable in the longer run. Uh, and economies in the periphery grew through credit expansion and an expansion of uh, consumer demand, uh, the housing, real estate sector, and imports. Uh, and this was certainly not a sustainable and a healthy way to grow. Uh, and these macroeconomic imbalances very heavily underlay the crisis in the Eurozone. And these, for these imbalances, the greatest part of, of responsibility or blame lies with the European Union, Eurozone institutions, uh, which were agnostic vis-a-vis -vis these imbalances, which uh, perceived that under the uh, single currency, the, the balance of payments constraint is of no relevance, that capital can flow very freely without any problem from the core to the periphery, and that this process uh, is not reversible in a destabilizing manner. Uh, these assumptions were proven to be wrong um, because we know that when this crisis came to the Eurozone uh, and transformed itself into uh, a sovereign debt crisis in 2010, this crisis was actually a balance of payments crisis. It was a, a crisis of capital flows, the same capital flows that had gone into the peripheral economies and were translated into private debt and a housing and, and banking bubble in Spain or Ireland and public debt uh, and a bonanza for the public sector uh, or domestic demand that was largely fueled by an overexpanding public sector in countries like Greece and partly Portugal. These private flows would go back again after the crisis erupted uh, and they started to retreat uh, from 2009 and even more so in 2010. And so for the Greek case, the crisis was transformed from a balance of payments crisis to a sovereign debt crisis because these uh, flows were funding the uh, public sector uh, spending and deficits. Greece had failed to list the primary budget surplus uh, from 2002. So for a long period of time, was producing primary budget deficits. Um, and in all, this was a crisis that was altogether a financial crisis, a banking crisis, a fiscal and public debt crisis, and through that also became an economic crisis because the uh, economic policy response was one of national level adjustment at a time when uh, the financial sector was heavily, uh, the, the economy was heavily deleveraging already at the time when capital was moving out and at the time when uh, the peripheral economies were in bad need of 
finance of capital in order to, to cover their deficits. So what is quite important from now on is to look at the modality of the crisis response because the modality of the crisis response has somehow shaped the uh, way through which this crisis has evolved in the Eurozone and the uh, potential outcomes and options that might lay before us. And the modality of response has the following features. I would say feature number one is that this is treated primarily as a national crisis for the countries that are affected, for the countries that are facing um, a problem of financing their deficits. And to a very significant extent, of course, it is. Nandigoni laid out this argument very well. And uh, similar criticism uh, goes on for the other countries that became the locus of this crisis in the periphery. But to a very significant extent, of course, this was also a crisis of the Eurozone architecture, which lacked the ability to prevent such a crisis, to even understand and appreciate the problem of macroeconomic imbalances, and uh, to make sure that something more than price stability is, is provided for in order to prevent financial instability and bubbles from building up. So it was a Eurozone systemic crisis, which had also to do with the lack of a response mechanism, with um, clauses such as the no bailout clause that were inapplicable in the face of such a crisis, and with a lack of any real lender of last resort mechanism, not for the banking sector, because for that we have the ECB, but for the, for the sovereigns. And thus, mecha ad hoc mechanisms were created, the bailout mechanism for Greece, and then the ESM in order to bail out the other countries uh, in crisis. Um, and ad hocery was a second crucial feature of the crisis response um, modality and a logic of muddling through. Now, I do not say that in a derogatory manner because the European Union, the Eurozone, is a consensus-based uh, organization with uh, significant supranational elements, but very important intergovernmental elements and veto players when it comes to the crucial decisions. And these were very crucial decisions that need to be taken. And there were decisions where the main interests that were involved were of an intergovernmental nature, or at least the most visible, the most salient conflict of interest was the one involving different national strategies. And for these decisions to be taken on a unanimity basis, there had to be a period of deliberation, there had to be grand compromises, and there had to be a lot of muddling through, which operated in a way with a logic of brinkmanship. At the last moment, when the crisis is, is really at its most extreme, when the Eurozone is, is, is uh, facing the, uh, the cliff, or the national economy is doing so, uh, we have a last moment arrangement, which comes too little too late. It solves the problem, it, we gain a few months, and then we move to the next step. Now, all this amounts to a sequence of measures that allowed the Eurozone to eschew the most extreme versions of the crisis, allowed the Eurozone to gain time in order to devise institutions, to gradually devise the kind of crisis response mechanism that we have today to produce uh, a momentous number of uh, institutional tools and, and, uh, and legislation um, to move to rescue packages for a number of countries and their banking sectors. All this under normal conditions would be the equivalent of a renaissance in the economic pillar of the monetary union, except that it was not because the time was far more pressing than the speed of adjustment uh, allowed for. And the, the time that was bought averted the worst, which was, I remind you, in the beginning of the crisis, there was speculation about a breakup of the euro. This was averted. I remind you there was speculation about catastrophic implications of 
several countries exiting the euro. This was averted. Um, and a logic of pretend and extend, as Antigonis uh, mentioned before, was um, uh, applied in a way uh, with regard to dealing with the debt problem and the debt overhang of uh, several countries, most notably including Greece. Now, this, is not, this was not a policy strategy that um, I would like to sanguinely oppose because this was the only available under the circumstances uh, crisis re response and crisis reaction strategy. Under the circumstances of a lack of institutional apparatus, of a lack of, of an appropriate architecture to handle such events, of even the lack of a mentality uh, that would expect and be able to accommodate uh, policy reaction to such crisis. And of course, under the uh, given political intolerance of national electorates to um, both sides of the adjustment strategy, both the uh, deflationary internal devaluation, fiscal consolidation, austerity policy mix at the national level. Toleration was very limited for the peripheral countries and the bailout that was attempted uh, for, for on the part of the core countries. Let me conclude by saying that all this has gained us time. All this has allowed the Eurozone to move closer to what can actually form a real and sustainable, because this is, not, this is a real but not sustainable policy mix in order to react to the crisis. It has allowed us to move closer to what has been called the genuine economic and monetary union, which involves fiscal integration, banking integration, and greater steps to economic integration. Fiscal integration will inevitably have to involve some degree of transfers. These cannot be permanent, but they have, they will come under conditions. They will have to have a stabilization role because what the crisis revealed was that the Eurozone faced the greatest depression in a part of the European continent. Certainly for Greece is the greatest depression that we have had in our recent history and the same goes for other peripherals as well, without a single stabilization policy instrument. At a time when all policy instruments, both fiscal policy, incomes policy, are contractionary, and even monetary policy, which is accommodative at the central level, is not uh, accommodative for the periphery, which takes the cost of credit at a much higher level. And the cost of capital is serving to exacerbate the crisis and aggravate the sovereign uh, banking uh, death spiral, as it has been called. So we are in great need of a stabilization policy instrument, of a fiscal capacity, if you like, or of a great stimulus to the periphery, or the equivalent of that, which would be helpful, but certainly not enough, uh, a demand stimulus in the core countries. And the, the other part of the transfers that are involved uh, have to do with banking union. We are closer to a banking uh, supervision for the Eurozone. Uh, the second pillar of bank resolution, bank resolution mechanism is evolving, but faster steps need to be taken because the crisis is looming and the, uh, the depth, the, the scope of recapitalization that needs to be done in the peripherals is large and also many core banks that have been exposed to the peripherals. And the third pillar, which unfortunately has been put aside, is um, a deposit insurance guarantee. And on that we need more by way of a greater sharing of the burden of adjustment. I'll, I'll close with that. This has been a crisis that has resulted very heavily from domestic and national level policy errors and, and governance failures. And Greece was the most prominent in these governance failures. But it is also a crisis that has been the result of a systemic um, set of, of weaknesses. And this requires by itself uh, a more shared, a more symmetric modality of response to the crisis. This means that this is a crisis whose cost, the cost of resolving which has to be undertaken at the Eurozone level. And it will have to involve uh, stabilization transfers, it will have to involve a heavier uh, investment stimulus and a, and a heavier support of unemployment to the periphery at the same time when the peripherals are doing their work in providing the structural adjustment that will render the return to recovery sustainable, 
at the time when they are balancing their budgets and increasing, enhancing the competitiveness of their economy and cleaning up their banking systems. We need a greater symmetry in the response. We need a more systemic uh, and comprehensive Eurozone approach uh, of what this crisis was and how we're going to get out of it. Thank you. The, the, um, um, so I, I am considerably more pe pessimistic. You see the, the title of the conference is Muddling Through, Breaking Through, and there is a third option, of course, breaking down, right? So, and and I, I want to sort of entertain the scenario and, and tell you why I think it's very difficult um, for EMU especially to sort itself out. I'm not sure if something goes wrong with EMU, that necessarily means that everything goes wrong with the EU, but it certainly is a possibility. And I want to give you um, sort of the logic that I, that I have. The, the, um, the, the question about fiscal union r reminds me of sort of when our master's students have to come and talk about their di dissertations. There are half of the questions in the first round are always, to what extent can the EU do this to help that? You know, sort of classic. And I always look them in the eye and say, if the EU is part of the answer, you may be asking the wrong question. Right? And this is how I think fiscal union at the moment is, is, set, is set up. I don't, think, I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing per se. I just don't think it's a so solution to the kind of problems that we're going through inside the EMU. And that has to do precisely with um, how domestic um, ca capitalist systems, dif different types of capitalism exist in, inside the EMU. And that, sort of, and that, that then has, I'll, I'll go through it, but that has loads of con consequences that I think we don't understand p particularly well. Le let me step back for a moment and pick up a point that, that George made, because that's a very important background point. Is that the EMU is a, is a, has, has a problem. Every monetary union, including Germany and the US, have this problem, which is that the, 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 the interest rate set by the central bank is always wrong for every individual mem member state. That's, that's just in the nature of the thing, in the sense that you have different inflation rates across EMU, and that means that the nominal interest rate that the central bank sets translates into pro-cyclical real interest rates across EMU, right? So the, the countries that have a high inflation rate, where the central bank, if they had a, a national one, would raise interest rates to counter that, in this particular instance, actually have a, a, a low re real interest rate and the other way around. And that's sort of, if, if you do that a few ge gen generations, you end up with small di differences being translated into massive di divergences. Um, so that's, that's sort of, the, that's, a, that's a very important structural background thing, because that means that one of the tools that um, we normally have associated with macroeconomic policy making, in, especially in times of crisis or in the run-up to crisis, that's no, no longer available and actually works against it. So you need to then think, what can um, economies do to counter that? And this is where the different types of economies that are underlying it co come in. Because what, what you discover is that, not only in the past but still now, um, the, 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 the countries essentially in the northwest of Europe, I call them um, in shorthand DE, yeah? the countries in the northwest of, of Europe, all of the economies that are very tightly in integrated into, ger into the German economy, both through trade, but also through things like wage shadowing, through things like price shadowing, and institutional sort of um, isomorphism almost, in the sense that they have taken on, on board a lot of the institutions that exist in, inside ger Germany. Um, they, they, they operate as one block in that sense. So we, we, we may have different responses here and there in the margin, but fundamentally they're one block. The rest of EMU, leave Ireland, uh, it doesn't change much to the logic, but that just, it, it, it clutters up things. I like a clean, clean sort of model, right? And, uh, the, the rest of EMU doesn't have that set of domestic institutions. I'm thinking of things like wage bargaining. I'm thinking of things like um, even at the level of how companies are organized, because that's quite important in, you know, in, in terms of international com competitiveness, skill systems. Uh, sorry, f fiscal po policy making are ve very different. And th those, those two, two, two families of ca capitalism that exist inside EMU, they begin to interact with this slightly diabolical pro cyclical effect of the, of the interest rate. Because what, what happens is that Northwestern Europe has the domestic institutions to, if inflation were to start rising, to bring them back under control. And I'll go over it in more detail in a second what these are. Southern Europe lacks that. Okay, now why is that the case? Here's a way to think about, um, well, let, let me back, back up for a moment. Why is this important? This is important because 
fundamentally, in a monetary union with a fixed exchange rate, which is what, what, what we have by definition, um, current accounts are a direct effect of competitiveness, and competitiveness is, in such a system, a direct effect of relative wage inflation rates in different economies. You, unit labor cost growth is another way of understanding it. That's the, the, the real exchange rate. I mean, there are three ways of saying this, the same thing. Now, why is this Im important? Because um, most of the um, Northwestern European economies have a system of wage de determination that links, through wage coordination, wages in different parts of the economy to a single tar target. And there are many ways to uh, do this, but here's the, the, the simplest way to uh, think about it. Think of an economy as essentially consisting of two sectors with a different inflation, two, in, two autonomous independent sectors. One is the, the part of the economy that is exposed to trade, and the other one, the, the other bit is the part of the economy that is not exposed to, to the trade. In the part of the economy that is not exposed to trade, there's really only one sector that matters for the story I want to tell, and it is the pub public sector. It's large enough for it to, to matter. Workers in the public sector are often very highly un unionized. In fact, in most of the European economies, it's all that's left of, of un unionization. The services they provide are not, don't have a very high price income elasticity, so people need to, to get them whatever happens. And they have lifetime employment. Right? Under any sort of you know, opportunistic model, these people would start trying to fight to, to, to raise their wages, and that's, that happens everywhere. Okay? And the question is, how do you, the, the other part of the economy, this is important, the part that's exposed to the trade doesn't have those ca characteristics. They may be highly un unionized. I don't think the metal working sector or the chemical sector in Ger Germany is weakly un unionized. But in the exposed sector, your wages, because of the mechanism I just gave you, the, the way your wages rise relative to others, that is how your labor productivity and wages interact, that is going de to determine whether you have employment to tomorrow, because you price yourself out of the market in an exposed sector, if your unit labor costs grow faster than those of your com com competitors, or it's going to de determine in the second round that your wages are going to come down. One of these two things, or both, have, have to, to happen there. So, th so there's a very serious constraint through the market, so to speak, on the exposed sector, despite the very strong tra trade unions that they have, to make sure that unit labor cost growth is kept under control. If you then think for a moment, all of Northwestern Europe has been wage shadowing for the last 20 years, or in fact longer since the existence of the Deutsche Mark in the middle of the 19, 1980s, you realize why you can talk about this as one, one, one economy, one, one integrated e economy. Now, how do you keep your domestic inflation rate under control if you have a very nervous pu pu public sector that you, that, that, that you cannot really control? The simple answer is that either you have institutional forms of coordination, or the export sector is so pro productive that in unit labor cost terms it can compensate for the wage growth in the, in, in the, in, in the uh, public sector. That is a system that exists in different forms in Northwestern Europe. That existed, in fact, in, in many countries in Southern Europe as well throughout the Maastricht criteria. If you look back at the history of the Maastricht criteria, what I just told you is exactly what happened in most of the countries of, 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 the, of Mediterranean Europe, is that public sector wages were kept under control um, through, uh, sorry, through co coordination run by the exposed sector in, in the e e e economy, or the exposed sector had such a high productivity rate that they could compensate for the above average unit labor cost growth rate in, in, in the public sector. After the institution of EMU, and fueled in part by this model of pro-cyclical in interest rates, that begins to change, right? And so as an effect, the inflation rates in much of Southern Europe begin to rise because this linkage between pu public sector wages and private and, and ma manufacturing ex export sector wages no longer exists, while it exists in part driven by the, 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 the fact that there isn't really another growth model in Northwestern Europe. Domestic demand doesn't really exist quite in the way that it could be used, and fiscal policy is constrained as well. And the effect is that these two very different models of capitalism that exist, somebody seems to disagree with this analysis. <laughs> These two different models of capitalism that exist in, in, inside EMU, they begin to create these di diabolical effects whereby one is always going to get more and more in debt because its current account is in, in, in deficit, current accounts have to be financed so you get bo borrowing to do so. 
and the others who, as a result of that, begin to run current account surpluses. EMU is fundamentally, until very recently, was fundamentally a completely closed economy. So that meant that your competitiveness gain was always going to be my competitiveness loss, was always going to translate for you in a, uh, a current account surplus and for me in, into a current account de deficit. And I don't have the domestic institutions to counter that, whereas you, ironically, have the domestic institutions to pr produce precisely that kind of outcome. And that di diabolical divergence that's sitting here, that makes it very difficult. This is where I come back to fiscal union. I'm also co concluding with it. That makes it very difficult to imagine what a fiscal union could do, because this is, this is not something that, sorts, that is a problem that you can sort out over a, a, a few days. In fact, most of the countries that um, in the 1990s under the Maastricht process managed to keep their wage setting systems under control, to keep their inflation rate under control, including Italy, which, did, which went through heroic restructuring between 1993, the Social Pact, and 1998 when it was accepted into EMU, including Italy, all of those countries have basically got back into trouble. I think in Italy, this is a sort of a small thing on the side, I think it wasn't absolutely necessary because I think Italy actually had found another equilibrium and I think Berlusconi helped by opportunistic um, employers who realized they had benefited from the old system but why not opportunistically sort of deregulate de and see what happens. They, they destroyed themselves but all the others were basically, that was a, a one-off for a few years where you could keep wage inflation rates under control. Now if that's true, then of course fiscal union is not going to help all that much. Because this is, then all you do, essentially, is finance a current account deficit the next time around. And you're not going to go um, into any kind of redistribution that would make sure that some, something else is going on. We can d discuss what you might want to do, because I think there are two. Do I still have a minute? Yeah? I think there are two things you can do. One is something along the lines of a, of a massive pu public investment plan in Europe. Some countries, as we know, ca could use it. Um, linked to a Keynesian kind of diabolical tax on capital that is not moving and is not being used. That, that combination. What, what? You don't think so? <laughs> no, but you, you, can, you, you can put a tax on money that's sitting in bank accounts and doing not, nothing while you give tax holidays to people who are using it to, to, to invest. A combination of these two things. And you could think of one political architecture that might help, and that is that if I'm right about these current account diversions being sort of the long-term drivers, then one fiscal tool that is, a, as it were, a tax on excessive inflation that could, that, that could counter it, because that would have meant, think of what that would have meant. In the years 2002 3 when Germany went through a massive re recession, there would have been money going from Spain, Ireland, Greece, and other countries that were growing fast into a common pool that would then be used for a Keynesian reflation in, in Ger Germany and would disinflate in the countries that were spinning out of control. And that would mean now that it would be politically a lot more pa palatable to say to the Germans, can we please you know, now do, do the same game the, the other way around. But that is not what's meant with a fiscal union. I mean, just that we, we are, the fact that there's a fiscal tool being used is, is a coincidence. That's not what's, you, what, what's meant with a fiscal union. A fiscal union means that you are not allowed to run a deficit above, above anything else um, or else you're, you're in trouble. This is not a redistributive system that acts as mu mutual insurance. Thank, thank you. Move on with uh, Hector Solas, um, Solas, sorry, uh, lecturer in economics at the University of Birmingham. Uh, I think Hector is going to give us more an experimental account of atmosphere solar distribution. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's uh, such an interesting workshop. I'm going to present a project I'm currently. Uh, doing is a is work in progress and I'm working in this project with Teresa Kuhn who is a lecturer at the Free University in Berlin. I'm gonna try to keep it simple and I'll do my best to do it fast. But please interrupt me if there's something. If it's okay, Nikita. Please interrupt me if you need some clarification because I'm gonna present an experiment. I'm a behavioralist myself so I'm going to approach this transnational solidarity from an individual uh, individual perspective. And yeah, the topic today is transnational solidarity in the, you know, in the EU, analyzing EU-wide redistribution in laboratory experiments. 
So, as uh, Gisela pointed this morning, we are all immigrants. I'm discussing with my co-author and friend, Reza, who is an Austrian. We were both working at Oxford in 2011. We were surprised that uh, governments were willing to send a lot of money to these uh, lazy, not so reliable countries of the south, in the south. As uh, Catherine pointed this morning, there are quite many parties uh, taking advantage of the situation of the EU. And we were surprised that these parties were so willing to send money. Uh, we didn't know it, that was out of simply responsibility, this real politics, or they knew they had some support from the from voters, from citizens. So what I'm going to present is this question. Uh, to what extent do European citizens show transnational solidarity? How willing they are to send money? The method we use is laboratory experiments in the UK and Germany. So yeah, we run experiments with people in the UK and Germany, but we do not use electroshocks or nothing like that. So you can see it's fairly simple. We simply give them money. And I'm going to present the preliminary results of this analysis and some open questions at the end. So this is our motivation. There is a call for transnational redistribution. And there are claims for more fiscal independence at subnational levels. I come from Spain. We just have to think about uh, Catalonia. We want to have more fiscal independence or uh, Scotland in the, in the United Kingdom. So there is a tension between community and, and a scope in Europe. I think that picture is fantastic. Merkel doing everything. So first, define, let's define solidarity. So as Stenio said in 2012, the preparedness to share resources with others by personal contribution to those in a struggle or in need, and through taxation and redistribution organized by the state. So we simply extend this concept to transnational extending beyond the national state. And why do we talk about national state? Well, it's been historically the main reference point. Well, why? Well, mainly because of the weight of national institutions. So most, the biggest part of the budget has historically been uh, distributed at the national level. But also for some parochial altruisms. That is, we tend to favor our own group. That means that solidarity is easier in more homogeneous societies. There's some scant empirical evidence, so there's some mixed results, but we think transnational solidarity seems quite difficult to, to achieve. So our first hypothesis when, when we started the, process, the, the project was that people redistribute less readily at the European level, that at the national or local level. But anyway, there should be some factors promoting transnational solidarity. And one of them is this collective identity we, we built in the last years in Europe. So if group identity is high, collective and personal interests might be interchangeable. And people with cosmopolitan identities are more willing to cooperate globally. This is a very nice uh, experiment project published in the PNAS in 2010 by some sociologists, psychologists, and economists. So the more globally integrated you are, the more willing you are to, to send money to some people somewhere else in the, in the globe. However, reciprocity has also played a role. Uh, the support for fiscal solidarity is based on, on reciprocity. If I'm, if I'm going to receive something, uh, and we just have to think on the common market, well, I might be more willing to redistribute. So for those two reasons, we thought that Germany would be more likely to be prone to transnational redistribution. Germany has always been a core country in the European Union, more pro-EU, that's what the surveys say. And there are higher economic and fiscal inter uh, interdependence within German and some other uh, economic uh, European countries. So our second hypothesis was that German citizens will redistribute more transnationally than United Kingdom uh, citizens. So we run our experiment in four locations. 
two in the United Kingdom and two in Germany. We picked up these locations thinking on subnational identities. So we chose Oxford and Berlin as quite a representative the national identity in the United Kingdom and Germany. And also because we were both in Oxford, it was easy. And also Edinburgh and Munich that represent some subnational identities within those countries. Those are the number of people participating in each location. We ran these experiments in April, May this year. And well, if we get more funding, it seems it's been the case. We are going to run these experiments also in Spain, uh, Poland, and probably Greece. So let me explain briefly what these experiments were. So the participants simply have to decide whether they would like to keep the endowment we give them or to allocate it to some other participants. And what we do is we vary the information they receive. So when we ask them to send, well, we don't ask them to send. We tell them that they can send some of the, that money at, to other participants. We inform them if those other participants are from the same region, from the same local community, the same country, or from another EU member state. And we also vary the scenarios to elucidate the impact of self-interest, trust, reciprocity. And at the end, we run a questionnaire to control for some socioeconomic uh, variables. OK, I started talking about transnational uh, solidarity and Germany supporting the bailout of Greece and so on. And now I'm talking about individual decisions in these uh, experiments in the lab. Yeah, I'm, we are making two quite big inferential leaps fiscal solidarity versus individual redistribution, and the context of the sovereign debt crisis versus these neutral, abstract, experimental instructions. Anyway, uh, we are making it very difficult for us. So if we find something in this very abstract environment, uh, could be kind of surprising. Actually, we find something. That's why I'm presenting it. But well, uh, this was shooting in our own food. So let me present the results. So these are the results coming from a dictator game. What we call the dictator game is simply that we inform participants that they can keep an endowment or send it to someone else. It's completely anonymous, confidential, so economic rational prediction would be keep all your money. Actually, they don't do it. Uh, these are average uh, amounts sent, and we see that they are all positive. Not huge, but positive. So we have the four location, Oxford, Edinburgh, Berlin, and Munich. And the first column, the dark blue one, is how much they send at the local level. <coughs> the light blue is at the national level, and the white that is almost invisible is at the European level. And yeah, we find some support. Yeah, this is a nice analogy. <laughs> uh, the first thing is that, well, we find partial support for our hypothesis. So people are more willing to send money at the local level, a bit less at the national, and less at the European. We find that in every location, but in Munich, that they are more willing to send at the European than to the national level. Uh, we still have to explain. Uh, this is simply some statistical uh, regression showing that, well, if once we pull all the data coming from the U United Kingdom and from Germany, the differences between national and local and European and local are only significant when we compare how much the people in the UK send at the European level compared to the local level. That they send significantly less money. We do not find any difference a statistical significant difference in Germany. Another scenario we used, is that the question? Uh, do, you, do you randomize countries? No. What do you mean by randomizing countries? Rather than doing Europe in general, being the Greek, Spaniards? No, we simply mention another EU yeah. member. I will come back to that in a, in a few slides. This is another scenario we used is 
in experimental economics, we call, we call it a public good. Experiment, a public good provision game, is simply a collective action problem. The people are much, participants are matched with some of the participants, uh, and they can contribute to a public good game, to a collective action game. Or keep the money for themselves. If the most efficient thing is to contribute to the collective action, the public good, but the only equilibrium in game theory is not to do it. Again, we see that they contribute to the public good, but if they are matched with people from their local community, they do it much more than when they are matched with people in the same country, and even less when they are matched with other what are the participants. Is that, is that the, the proportion who says... Yeah. No, this is the amount sent. So they could send uh, up to 100, uh, from zero to 100, and they do it, that's the average. Is it, is it repeated or is it? No, it's one shot, so they only do it once. Yeah, so something what, that was quite surprising is that the, there are not big differences between national and European. So they are more willing to contribute to these public goods when they, are, when they are local, but not so much when they cannot. I'm really sorry, Hector. I still don't understand that left column. 30, 35, 40, 70. Are you, are you saying that the Berliners, both nationally, locally, and European, say I'd be 63,000 away, and the opposite lot only 45? What's their top ceiling? What's the, the ceiling was 100, so this is at the end of the day a percentage. Out of 100,000, you say, how much would you keep? Actually, we didn't have so much money that it was 100 pounds. <laughs> so, out of 100,000? Exactly. In both columns, the Berliners always gave away more than Oxford were the meanest of the lot. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So they, they, they were willing to meet up to 64% yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of the money we gave them. Yeah. <laughs> but in this case, the most rationalized physical lights. Sorry again? In this case, the most rationalized physical lights. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. The most rational is to give nothing, but the most... <laughs> But the most efficient is to give everything. So if we all contribute to the public good, we all make yeah, the most. Exactly. Well exactly. Well exactly. Well exactly. Well exactly. exactly. We have no information about what the other people are doing. So yeah. it's quite risky to invest in the public good because maybe the other people are not doing it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 it's fine. Yeah. For sure. When we compare, again, the UK and Germany, surprisingly, in the UK, there are no differences between the local and the European level, but when they are matched with some other uh, national fellows, they are less willing to contribute to this public good, and in Germany, they are less willing to contribute to public good when they are with other national or European fellows. That was surprising because it points in the direction that Germany uh, citizens are less willing to invest in this kind of collective actions when they are matched with people from all the communities that are not the local ones. There were no. Uh, if they ask, yeah, we provide them with, uh, with examples, but we try to keep it as neutral as possible, not to load in any, in any way. Uh, can I ask, is mm -hmm. it a difference between the subjects? Were in Berlin all economic students or? They are all students and they are all students from uh, social sciences in, in all four, but, but, no, but not, but not. Maybe, maybe. No, we, are sp we explicitly asked for uh, citizens from that region. And they were all students in that uh, university. But they are all students. Uh, we, did it, we did it for two reasons. First of all, because students uh, care more about money. So it's an important thing for them. With non-students, you never know how rich they are. And the second reason was because this might be the first generation of <coughs> proper Europeans. They've only known this supranational state. They've not lived in any other uh, environment. So what happens with this public good game, with this collective action problem? Well, the, the public good involves some trust and reciprocity. So you have to 
somehow anticipate what the other people are going to do in order to decide how much to invest. In, in economics, it's called conditional cooperation. Only the, if the other people invest, you should do it. And in this frame of sovereign debt crisis and Germany being considered a big contributing country to other less reliable countries, uh, maybe that might have an, an, an impact. And that's what we find. When we ask them which country did you have in mind when we mention another EU country, uh, the most frequently mentioned in Germany was Spain, while in the UK it was not in particular or France. So that might derive some of the results we observe. So just to conclude. Any Exactly. Not anymore at all. I, I studied in Berlin, so I mean, it's where the government is, it's where everybody goes to study. Exactly. It's so most. It's always difficult to get into. The consistency being so out of sync with our three. They're very cosmopolitan. Yeah, but so they would. They probably have got all such rich parents that doesn't matter what they do with their money. That is, that is transnational solidarity with us. Yeah, so but we are talking only about the European Union. So we mentioned another European Union member. So, so my, my argument is that if we talk about transnational solidarity, I'd be very surprised that Joe Public on British streets would make a difference between, you know, the most mentioned country is France, then it'd be it kind of... It is you. Everyone's trying to keep that secret. Zero for me. Okay, let me conclude with some remarks. So we have, we find mixed support for our hypothesis. Uh, yeah, people are more willing to send money at the local level than at any other level. But Germany citizens are German citizens are not so willing to send money at the European level as we assume. The clear support is in dictator game, which is pure solidarity. I mean, it's only self-interest involved. It doesn't involve any trust. Um, or reciprocity as yes, the public good game. And we find similarities between Oxford and Munich and between Edinburgh and Berlin that might suggest that then political ideology or economics prosperity might have an impact. But we are still in the process of analyzing that data because we run a very long questionnaire and it takes a while. So the next step is to analyze these individual level factors, cross validate our results with some existing survey data, and now that we have the funding, run some additional experiments in some other countries. So thank you very much. And please. So uh, let's move on to our final presenter for this panel, uh, Mr. Antonio Camaras. Uh, Antonio is an advisor to the mayor of Saloniki, uh, Mr. Yamas Paris. And he's also a research associate of the Yamas. And I, you know, I I've left it last just because it's going to focus on the local level and on the question of uh, local tax. Okay, my, my presentation will not be about who gets to foot the bill, but rather about who gets to tally it, collect it, and spend the proceeds. It is connected, however, to the willingness to foot the bill, the part that belongs to the Greek people, that is, as I hope I will be able to convince you. More specifically, I will talk to you about the property tax in Greece, which was universally applied for the first time two years ago, when the Greek government desperate to expand its tax base to meet its obligations to its creditors, introduced a property-linked tax paid through electricity bills. This fiscal measure has been one of the most hated in Greece and at the same time 
one of the most effective. And these two features are, of course, interdependent, to put it mildly. For 2014, and subject to the agreement with Troika representatives, this tax, known by its initials as ATD, or in the ver vernacular as Haratsi, the Ottoman word for the tax imposed on all non-believers, will be replaced by a more complex property tax, the FAP, which will be, however, nearly as universal as ATD, in the sense that the vast majority of property owners in Greece will have to pay it. So the property tax, in all its different guises, has all the elements that are defining of Greece's relationship with Troika. Necessary reforms, if Greece is to acquire the capacity to finance a state worthy of, of the expectations of its people. Reforms which are, however, lacking in legitimacy due to their abrupt introduction at the instigation of an outside agent and in an extremely unfavorable economic environment which compounds the pain that they cause for the vast majority of the Greek people. Last but not least, reforms that can be owned by the Greek political system if the latter acquires acquire the, 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 the courage to own them by adjusting and channeling the thrust towards the specific circumstances that define the country. I'll proceed as follows. First, very briefly outline for the initiated among you, and I belong to that category just a couple of months ago, what are the main characteristics of a local government property tax? Second, present to you some of the main features of local government financing in Greece and evaluate how these features were affected by the country's fiscal crisis. Third, I'll make the argument that turning the property tax to local government possesses decisive benefits for both the central and local government and for the country at large. What is a property tax? What is a local government tax? And what are the characteristics of the property tax on its own right and as a local government tax? Answering these three questions will suffice for the purpose of this presentation. Let's take them one by one. First, property taxes, as an IMF study defined them, encompass a variety of levies on the use, ownership, and transfer of property. Second, a local government tax, and in most jurisdictions, property taxes are local government taxes, has in its purest, for most unqualified form, the following characteristics. Local governments decide whether to levy the tax or not. Local governments can also determine the precise base of the tax. Local governments can decide the tax rate. Local governments administer, assess, collect, enforce the tax. Local governments get to keep all the revenue of the tax they collect. In practice, there are all, all sorts of types of revenues that belong to in-between categories. But the important fact for our purposes, as will become clear when we talk about Greece, is that a tax is not a local government tax unless and until local government has responsibility for imposing this tax on local taxpayers. By contrast, local government revenues that are computed as a percentage of taxes determined, assessed, and collected by the central government are considered as essentially central government transfers, as local governments neither own them in the political sense, nor are they in a position to stop the central government if the latter wishes to curtail them or eliminate them. A significant and highly relevant co corollary is that local taxes tend to be a much more stable source of local government finance as opposed to central government transfers that are the object of yearly negotiations and subject to the fiscal contingency of the day. The third, the third, the characteristics of property taxes in their own right and, and, and as local government taxes are as follows. As local government taxes, they're the ultimate benefit tax as they finance public goods and services consumed by those who pay them, schools, roads, etc. They can be politically unpopular as they are highly visible, often tax unrealized income and unlike, say, income tax are subjectively assessed. It has, been, it has been said that this least popular tax, the economists like them much more <laughs> than the politicians, uh, should become, in order to become politically viable, it should finance the most popular causes, as in schools. Property taxes as local government taxes can be the effect, the cause being the desire, the desire for decentralization in many high-income countries 
that in turn needs to be financed by compatible fiscal arrangements. Conversely, property taxes in developing and middle-income countries are either minuscule or non-existent, due not least to the unwillingness of local governments in many jurisdictions to tax their own voters. There is wide agreement that property taxes as local government taxes increase accountability of local government to local voters who are also local property taxpayers. Finally, the more developed the country is, the higher the property tax intake in relation to GDP is. The OECD group of countries average is 2.1% of GDP. The middle income countries, in the middle income countries it is 0.9% of GDP, and for developing countries it is 0.6 of GDP. Now let's come to Greece. The breakout of the crisis found the Greek local government as one of the most dependent in Europe on central government transfers, to the tune of 70% of the total expenditure, when the EU average is 44%. Basically, Greek local government is both one of the smallest in Europe in terms of the ratio of its expenditure to, to, expenditure to GDP, and at the same time, one of the most dependent on central government transfers for its financing. The main instrument of these transfers are the so-called Kendriki Aftotelis Pori, CAP, which by law are tabulated as supposedly fixed percentages of income tax, value-added tax, and property tax. Consistent with the findings of the literature that would categorize CAP as a central government transfer that local government has no substantial control over, the Greek central government cut them by a cumulative 50% since the outbreak of the crisis. The lack of political ownership of these revenues meant the local government was powerless to resist the drastic cutback, nor did this cutback result in widespread popular opposition. A commitment by the central government, even one inscribed in law, to apportion X percentage of Y tax source to local government no matter how rational and justified it might be, is at best an abstract notion to a resident and voter of a municipality, and at the most common worst, something that he's completely ignorant of. The other side of the crisis coin is that the central government, as I pointed out in my introduction, bit the bullet by introducing a universal property tax. This is something that it had conspicuously failed to do so in the past, when instead it would lower or raise or even eliminate taxes on the more valuable properties and rely instead on the non-recurrent, less substantial profit, property transfer tax, the equivalent of the, of the UK stamp duty. According to media reports, FAP, which is going to replace ATD in 2014, Although far more complex, with approximately 20 payment scales determined by various criteria, will only exempt those who are unemployed and have small property holdings. Even rural plots of land will be taxed, and to grasp the radicalism of this measure, it is worth pondering Mark Mazaur's remark that Greek farmers, from being the backbone of both the Byzantine and Ottoman imperial tax systems, got a seemingly permanent permanent tax exemption since Greece won its independence in 1821, being courted from then on by kings and dictators as much by parliamentarians. So this is the opportunity offered by Troika to the cause of Greek local government and decentralization. The political cost of introducing a near universal property tax has already been undertaken by the central government. The only thing that remains to be done is for the local government to shoulder the lesser cost of asking and receiving responsibility to determine, assess, and collect a nearly universal property tax that by the time it gets to do so, say 2015, to be very optimistic, the central government would have already bedded down and collected for three years in a row. Essentially, Greece's fiscal crisis has, among other things, discredited the existing system of financing local government and exposed the central fact that fiscal dependence on the central government and local government autonomy are incompatible notions. At the same time, the crisis, by compelling the central government to introduce for the first time ever a nearly universal property tax, has created the foundations in the near future for a more autonomous, fiscally self-sufficient local government. 
In my last section, I will argue that it is to the benefit of the local government, of the central government, and ultimately of Greece itself, that local government pursues and achieves the goal of converting the property tax into its most important revenue raising instrument. I would separate the benefits that can be attained by converting the property tax into a local government tax in three distinct categories, namely those relating to the central government, those to the local government, and those to the Greek polity and economy at large. For the central government, this conversion can have the benefit of sharing the political costs of the property tax by transferring it to local government and by thus increasing its legitimacy, enabling the property tax to make a permanent contribution to public finances. The conversion can replace central government transfers, freeing up fiscal resources for other needs, and or financing further decentralization by transferring public goods and services to the local government, which can be funded by, by the property tax. For the Greek local government, the benefits are several. Being predominantly financed by local property taxes will mean greater funding stability for local government, allowing for longer planning horizons as much as for the protection of vital public goods and services. Local property tax will massively increase accountability and transparency due to the amount of skin in the game that local residents will have in local government expenditure. It is an entirely plausible assumption to make that with the introduction of local property taxes, accountability and transparency will be more powerful forces in local than in national government with beneficial results for the performance of the former. Local government can turn the tables on central government, win a reputation for greater competence and integrity than the central government, and on the back of such a reputation, fight for further decentralization and power. Cumulatively, the conversion of the property tax into a local tax can be the catalyst for Greece acquiring the level of decentralization that both its developmental states, the crisis notwithstanding, and the increasing desire for local autonomy in a set state. From the perspective of the Greek polity and society, turning the property tax into a local government tax will mean strengthening across Greece and in each and every one of the 328 municipalities of the country the mentality of the citizen as a taxpayer, which is to say the mentality of the individual who cannot avoid paying taxes and thus cannot avoid being concerned, agitated or satisfied by the extent to, in which his taxes provide commensurable benefits to him and his family. It will also mean having political contestation ac across Greece in each and every municipality being grounded on the issue of taxation, its assessment, collection, exemption from and on what grounds, and conversion in public goods and services. This, uh, I believe, cannot fail but contribute to the creation of the citizen as taxpayer at the national level where the connection between taxation and public expenditure is necessarily more abstract as taxes are, by and large, not hypothecated, and the goods and services they create might or might not have a geographical or any other explicit connection to the taxpayer. Last, but definitely not least, from the perspective of the national economy, the property tax as a local government tax will vest all of Greece's municipalities in the cultivation and expansion of this tax base to the boosting of, the, of local economic growth. Municipalities will thus gear themselves, not towards accessing funding from the central government, or at least not exclusively in that direction, but in setting up local growth coalitions with other local stakeholders, chambers of commerce, universities, professional associations, ports, airports, hotels, and the like. These stakeholders, in turn, will be pressing for the deployment of the taxes towards public goods that can facilitate economic growth, as opposed to being similarly focused to rent-seeking from the central state, as they, as they have been up to. As with the bottom-up development of the citizens' taxpayer, this dynamic, multiplied by 328 municipalities across the land, cannot but have a material and positive in impact on the Greek economy and its international competitiveness. This way will come full circle. The universal property tax, which in Greece is yet another outcome brought about by the catastrophic underperformance of the Greek economy, will be making a contribution to this economy's renaissance. To sum up, Greece has long been an outlier within the EU 
and the OECD in terms of its uh, level of decentralization and the degree of fiscal dependence of local government on central government, putting the country somewhere between the developing and mid middle income cohorts. Regardless of the fiscal crisis, the next step in the agenda of decentralization in Greece would have involved measures extending the, fisc the fiscal autonomy of local government. The crisis, however, as with so many other features of the country's public life, has brought this issue into sharp re relief, mainly because of the cut in half of central government transfers to local government. Now the ball is in the local government's court. Greek local government owes it to itself to ask for the burden and benefit of taxing the people it represents in order to advance their well-being and future prospects. And while this is not the only step in this direction, it is the most logical and effective one, namely to convert the already instituted property tax into local government's main revenue raising instrument. Thank you. So I think I would like to collect you know, one round of questions and then I'll just give you the chance to respond to them. So, uh, there's a, I have a question for Georgios Fabiatos here. Um, there seems to be an inconsistency between the program implemented by the Troika and the objectives of the task force assistance in Greece. For those who don't know, the task force provides technical assistance for administration reform in Greece. However, between the inside the government circles, people say that we cannot design reforms which normally take place in other countries and demand a period of 10 years or more, like reforming the central government. And at the same time, for responding to the demands of the Troika uh, for fiscal adjustment every, every three to three months. So my question is, if Greece successfully exits the program or becomes or becomes part of a European program next year, and uh, the IMF is not the only part of the Troika, what's the future of structural reforms in, in Greece? Uh, the gentleman in the back? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, There's actually a microphone. Can you also please introduce yourself? Yes, uh, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Peter Russell. I'm uh, here as a, a visitor and uh, I used to work as an advisor to the mayor of the city of Glasgow in the, in the UK. So I have a, a colleague here and it's on his, uh, it, it, it's on his mark that I'd like to, to comment. And it's above all about the, about the relevance of strong local administrations, strong local government within the governance of a country, and in particular, much of what we've spoken, I've heard spoken about since I arrived at lunchtime today, was about the problem of having a political elite, a political class that was very different from the citizens it was meant, meant that, who they're meant to represent, and the value of strong local government, strong local administration is that it provides a class or a certain standard of citizens who are also politicians at the same time, as well as building local capacity to take really vital decisions on behalf of the people that, that, that they represent. There are a couple of notes of advice I've given on the local property tax. The first one is keep your valuations up to date because otherwise they go out of date very quickly and become resented by people, as we have in the UK at the moment. Make sure, fight like tigers to keep it local, that it's not diverted uh, to national, national purposes. And finally, I understand in Germany that the non-domestic property tax on uh, businesses doesn't only apply to land, it applies to the whole assets when they're making their, 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 their valuations. So that's a further source of revenue that's there from the wealth creators within the economy. Hello, Ali. You described well the uh, how we have come up to the situation today. 
how probable and like actually how probable do you think that um, the move to start the project is fiscal union is given that all the steps that have been taken until now are of a kind of individual responsibility approach. I mean the fiscal compacts, the six packs of compact everything pretty much is about countries doing on their own what they have to do so that there's no need for others to pay for them. Uh, the only supranational solution really is uh, the banking union, but uh, as long as we cut past the first issue, which was the, the complex single supervisory mechanism, then we really got down the business about the resolution mechanism. Already we see great efficiencies and quite strong language gems. Um, so, how likely do you believe, especially if somehow go through this crisis, that further movement towards uh, something that really presents this new um, for Bob, well, well, it's hard to disagree with the analysis, but um, a lot of these issues were pretty much done before, okay, the, uh, before being new, <laughs> even came to be. So it was, uh, as we all know, it was a political decision to go ahead with this. So why do you think that these reasons are now um, powerful enough to overcome the political will? to somehow um, keep the years all together. I mean, we've seen even Nobel uh, Prize winners from the beginning of the crisis arguing that any time now, the years are going to collapse, um, but it's still here. Um, and if somehow, again, we somehow survive the crisis in a couple of years, um, do you still think that in the, in the long term, this is not uh, sustainable? And the last, Question to Hector is um, it's not the point of the, of the experiment. I mean, you acknowledge, as you said yourself, you acknowledge that there is a technological difficulty from going from the individual level to the collective one. Um, but I think there is perhaps another issue in between, and that this issue is that the fact that you assume that people, um, you seem to assume perhaps it's related to the question about individual countries, which has been for five years. Um, the situation that people will tend to identify a public good for the salvation of a country in the Eurozone. But the thing is that in many countries in the north, uh, resting Greeks has been, in the media, in the political rhetoric, has been pretty much presented as you know, um, doing something which is not very, uh, um, uh, not presented very much common the good approach. I mean, the, the late Greeks, the Italians, so on, kind of rhetoric. So perhaps it would be very interesting to see Berlin, the Berlin, the Berlin case, the number of um, the, the level of solidarity would be the same if the question instead of public good was to rescue Greece or Italy or whoever else, because the two are not necessarily uh, identical. Yes. Uh, yeah, before I have, uh, I have two more questions. Uh, okay. Uh, just, just, just a very uh, quick question to, to Joel. The traditional IMF package, when they come in, is you increase taxation, reduce public spending, and you keep value. Now, the Greek package, I cannot see how you can regain competitiveness if you're not allowed to value. And just to slightly explain my hackle on, on the court, there was a, there was a letter to the FT on Thursday. Keynesian stimulus does not work for pockets, and it goes through the calculation which I want to bore you with. But essentially, the, 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 the conclusion it draws is that Keynesian stimulus is not working because it's public. But then it says, in other words, the Greeks need a bailout of about $800 billion per year, every year, to keep the economy at 250 billion. So I think you said yourself that this wasn't a sustainable solution. But if you're not then, if you can't regain competitiveness as well the value, and you need year on year bailouts, is that the future to make it work? Yeah. Uh, is it a short question? Yeah, no. yeah sure. It is. Okay. Basically, it's correct. Um, so, I think that the experiment would be much more interesting if it was symmetrical. So, it's not you give an endowment and now out of your generosity you give something away. But it's, you don't know whether you're going to be the recipient or the donor. So let's try to find what's the optimal we think we should be giving without knowing if we will benefit from it or be paying it. 
because I think it's more akin to the EU citizenship mindset, and I think it would be a very interesting experiment to run. So, okay. I don't know how complicated it would be. But... Okay, let's uh, get the first round of responses. Who would like to go first? Right. Same order or? Opposite. In inverse order. Inverse? And then? You don't want George? to go? No, no, no. 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 Is there a microphone? Yeah, I thought it was re re reverse order. Yeah, that's right. But it is just the oh, so Don't you start? speak too long at the start? I think I thought you speak a little more time, so George will say it. Okay, thank you. I received three questions. The first question from Panagiotis is whether there is inconsistency between the Troika and the task force. Yes, there is. And what is the future of structural reform? Well, the Troika, I think, has sort of outlived its usefulness. Its usefulness not to be um, underestimated. It's been huge in the sense that we needed front the program structural reforms. We needed a sort of external push. We needed not in terms of uh, um, in, in terms of instrumental utility, not in terms of the credit for our national governance of the political system, which obviously it is not. But it is true that the external constraint by the Troika helped overcome very significant uh, resistance to structural reform, helped uh, front load several reforms that had been pushed under the carpet for decades, health reform, pension reform, um, local government reform, tax administration reform, and there have been areas where the know-how that has been given uh, by the Troika has been quite significant, and this has very significantly relied on the know-how of the IMF. Uh, tax administration, for instance, tax governance reform, has been truly remarkable over the last few years. Of course, with not um, results up to the level of the reforms that have been advanced because of the recession, because of the lower tax revenues as a result of the recession, but um, many things have changed in the way in which the government in the world in a sense conduct, conducts day to day business, and many areas that have been touched have actually changed very dramatically the last few years. Having said that, I think that the Troika has outlived its usefulness. First of all, there is a, a simple minded focus on uh, the specific quarterly targets. This does a great deal of harm to the ability of the government, of any government system, to concentrate in the medium and long term. All this is done at the expense of longer term restructuring of the economy. The program has been severely prosecutable. Uh, the Greek economy was based on the mission impossible from the first place, from, from the beginning, because it had to devalue internally, I'll, I'll come to your question at the moment, it had to pursue at the same time a policy of internal devaluation which led in order to restore competitiveness and target the current account deficit, which was at 14% value, which meant a, a very severe recession of the economy. At the same time, it had to target the fiscal deficit level, which could only be achieved through a growing economy, because the recession of the economy was undermining the public debt to GDP ratio, and thus leading to fiscal target slippage year by year, whereby it was, uh, year by year, it was more difficult to collect tax revenues, and the uh, spending was increasing as a result of growing recession unemployment. Then you have to double the efforts, and doubling the efforts meant that you were mired into deeper and deeper recession at a time where there was no counter cyclical loosening, and where the simultaneous crisis at the sovereign debt level, at sovereign level, at the banking level, was operating in a self multiplying manner. So the program was far too heavily front loaded and far too heavily procedural. And that has been the result of not allowing more time. The, the degree of fiscal consolidation that has been implemented in Greece has been truly remarkable and I would say unique by international standards. Uh, the primary budget deficit has been reduced from a 10% achieved level down to zero in three years, uh, a little above in three years. Now this, you, you can never find a fiscal consolidation of such a magnitude at a time of a, a recession of a shrinking economy which has lost about 25% of GDP. And clearly, there is a causal relationship between these two. So this should have been given more time. If it had been given more time, then the recessionary impact wouldn't be so large. Then the reversible effects of the recession on unemployment, we have a structure of unemployment, which is not the kind of 
type of problem that you hear from commission uh, statements. Our problem is not just youth unemployment. There's a problem with long-term unemployment, for instance, it's a problem with 300,000 families without a breadwinner, and it's a problem of unemployment that hits people in their 50s. Now, this is a, a serious erosion of human capital and productive capacity of any economy, and it owes a lot to the intensity of fiscal consolidation. Now, of course, starting from such a level of primary budget deficit, there is a question how you finance this, these needs uh, if you have to rely on the balance. And this is clearly the political reason why the consolidation problem was so front loaded, because it needed funding. Funding did not exist at the EU level, it had to be drawn at the cross national level, it had to, to acquire the agreement of other, a number of other European parliaments, and clearly this sort of uh, went close to exhaust the limits of political tolerance. So this is the reason why the problem is so front loaded, but this is also the, the the expression of the structural weakness of the Eurozone that it lacked from the first moment a kind of a level of last support instrument or a counter cyclical fund that would be able to help the economy overcome such a crisis with a lack of necessary macro and microeconomic policy instruments without such a, a huge damage and to a certain extent the reversible damage to its productive base and its economy. Now, the Troika continues to operate in a world of very few variables. Its variables are the deficit and the current account. Uh, its variables do not include the productive capacity, they do not include the human capital and the erosion of it, and they do not include even, I would say, <coughs> the financing needs of a large number of productive, efficient enterprises that cannot access finance. And recently, they do not even include social political stability. I find their insistence on layoffs extremely short-sighted at the time when unemployment is at 28% levels. We've been about a month now in a series of constant strikes. Almost nothing will operate in the broader public sector <coughs> because of the layoffs of 30,000 uh, people. That was the area where the Troika was opposed to the task force. We need real instruction, organization instruction in the public sector. We need evaluation of public sector. This cannot operate at a time when at the end of this evaluation process we have the layoffs. They should have either been done in the beginning of the process when unemployment was much lower. Of course, many of these people should have never been hired before, but you cannot correct the mistake by committing a new mistake, by doing something that is completely out of time and out of context. Uh, the Italy, uh, how probable is the move to fiscal union? I, I'm not, I would like to be an optimist, but, but I am very skeptical as to how the Eurozone will really be able to exit this crisis. What we have seen so far is a modality, as I said, of monthly through. I think that the most we would expect, I'm actually involved in a, in a, in a project, a trans-European project called New Pact for Europe, we're trying to map potential strategic options for Europe, and the two most realistic or plausible options are to choose between a monthly through pattern or an ambitious monthly through pattern, an ambitious incrementalism. I think this is the most we can hope for. Ambitious incrementalism could do the job that means muddling through, but also establishing an ESM capacity with the adequate firepower to confront problems of, of extensive bank capitalization and government um, bailouts, uh, with perhaps the ability to draw on the resources of the ECB, and steps towards a fiscal union, which I think could and should involve, should and could involve a fiscal capacity, a degree of fiscal capacity, uh, something resembling a cyclical um, stabilization insurance fund, there is a, a detail of how this would work in a recent control uh, report, which means that economies that will be growing will be net contributors to such a fund. So Greece would have been a net contributor to cyclical stabilization insurance fund all the way until 2008. Uh, and in order to be in a position to be net recipients at a time when the crisis breaks, and they have absolutely no macroeconomic instruments to react, they have no fiscal instrument, and there's no finance available because the country risk is written on the forehead of very single enterprise that cannot access the capital markets because it's peripheral and it belongs to a country whose sovereign is, is, is bankrupt. Uh, we need this counter cyclical insurance, uh, cyclical uh, stabilization insurance fund or an unemployment insurance fund. And uh, if, if failing uh, that, uh, we could use, and I think this is quite realistic, a very serious investment boost to the periphery. Uh, this has been called by some uh, Marshall Plan Fund, uh, the SPD supposedly 
uh, supporting that um, 10 or 15 billion or a percentage of uh, structural funds that could be front loaded uh, at the time when the economy is in urgent need of recovery. And this recovery cannot happen just by structural reforms. Structural reforms are important, but they operate with a time lag. They allow you to render a recovery sustainable after you've exited the crisis, but they cannot really take you out of the crisis when your economy is on free fall and all the policies are persistent at the same time. So the, the South, especially Greece, Spain also, even to a certain extent, indeed, an urgent uh, counter cyclical investment stimulus that would create this big push to exit. Now, this is a form of the fiscal union. It might not be enough, it might not be adequate to carry the euros over to the next 10 or 20 years. But it is absolutely necessary in order uh, for uh, the periphery to remain uh, social, political, and minimally social, social economically stable within the euro. Um, finally, uh, the question uh, by, by, by Giselle. Um, I have read this article yesterday on the FT, and uh, I think that it is based on the wrong uh, premise. He, he has an estimate, I think. Is it the Quentin Peel article? Or, uh, I remember the article, I don't remember who it was. No, Quentin Peel was on Germany. Uh, I think he has an estimate that the Greek GDP was it really unfair? Yes, that, that the Greek GDP should actually be in the area of 170 uh, billion uh, dollars or something. Yeah, that it was paid so that hence the argument that you could not stimulate the bubble and so forth. Well, you can have different estimates of what the sort of the, the real level of Greek GDP should be. The, the big issue that is that in in a monetary union the only instrument of adjustment that we have is not currency devaluation, it is internal devaluation. By the way, internal devaluation has worked quite well for the case of Germany. Uh, read the recent uh, article of a proposal for um, uh, the reference for the uh, Peterson Institute and the recent article of Martin Wolf on the FD, who exactly talks about how Germany uh, took its way out of out of the crisis and, and towards uh, almost full employment that it now has to export that growth through a policy of internal devaluation. Now the problem of course of internal devaluation is extremely painful and it needs, it cannot be carried out uh, only from one part. We have a serious problem here to cost divergence in the Eurozone, which is partly a result of, uh, of wages having been uh, too high in the periphery, and part of uh, the other part of the wages having been too low in the core. And if you are operating in a single uh, Eurozone economy, you have to have all parts operating, operating together. So the exit from the crisis and the return to a viable, sustainable, not a bubble level of GDP would actually rely on the South delivering, continuing the policies of structural reforms and considerable degree of internal evaluation. By the way, four fifths of this adjustment has already been done. The recurrent account is, is nearly zero having started from 14.5% of GDP in 2008. But at the same time, this process has to be supported by uh, a, a demand stimulus and wage increases in the core countries and a more balanced uh, growth model for the core countries. Because what we have today as the doctrine of, of macroeconomic stability in the Eurozone and the European Union is that the current account deficit level that's tolerated for the previous four percent and the current account surplus level that's tolerated for the, for the core countries is six percent. There's no symmetry in that. And and this is why the Eurozone has to respond in by way of an integrated response to the crisis. And we continue with this fragmented modality of policy responses and we expect to have uh, an exit from the Eurozone crisis as a result of national level uh, adjustment of austerity programs in the periphery will never get out of the crisis and there will be a breaking point that will be reached, whether it will be Greece or Spain or Italy to, to come first in this breaking point, no one knows, but there will be a breaking point when the periphery will not be able to have it anymore and that will be the moment when things will become reversible. I think there is time, there is a little opportunity in Germany through this uh, coalition government for a more balanced uh, approach to exiting the euro crisis would have to involve the greater participation of burden sharing in the part of the core countries. Excellent. Uh, who wants to go next? Maybe. Center? Yeah. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so, the first question was a good question. So, what happens? We don't mention the EU weakness and the concrete counters. 
just an nice for what? That's something we had in mind. The problem is that this was kind of best in front of the point. Now that we have completed the final experiments, but we kept it as very, uh, I know they were in uh, member state, in part because of what you also mentioned now. Uh, there's always the room of a new mass of land, this kind of public good that we all continue to be all benefit from the information. So we thought that what we had mentioned on the current view would continue from the European perspective. But we can some of us uh, relatively active in the situation. And it also gives us room to run this experiment in other countries and check. Now we have to analyze what we have because we do not run any, any statistical tests yet on differences between uh, countries, people have a match. It seems that depending on if they are in a southern country or another country, they uh, behave in some way. We have to have to show. Uh, Albert's question. Actually, we wanted to have it as well. To have a design as well, it's not that possible. And not only the democracy that we are able uh, to avoid the, the institutional uh, approach to the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah, we, we also got some old games, like not presented the implied this kind of institutional uh, issue. Uh, we'll have a democracy, but I don't have the power to redistribute the money. Actually, the local and national level will be uh, then the results are uh, more difficult to accept. But yeah, we are very important to try to explain that. Bob? Yes, sir. <coughs> let, let me first deal with this uh, small issue of um, change doesn't help you. Right? Uh, like in the 1930s and in the 1940s, things didn't help. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but the, 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 the political will question, though, that's, that's an interesting one. I'm, gonna, I'm going to, to first. Okay. The, the problem with political will is that think, think of it in this way. There's a lot of political will to keep Ar Ariel Sh Sharon alive. Is it sustainable? Is a question, right? So you have to be careful about what is exactly the reason. But here is the thing I, I don't have a. A crystal ball has made in Stuttgart, so I don't actually know the future as a result. Um, Stuttgart will be yeah, what they make, all these competitive German robots. That you can think of a lot of scenarios, in fact, more, more by, the, by, the, by the half year almost. It's like every half year now there's, a, there, there, there's another, it started with um, this horrible word, great crazy. Catherine has now pointed out a few times over the day that it is now reasonable to talk about leaving the euro, even in countries that supposedly be benefit from it. But then you have the ones um, that are so, and, and Germany may eventually get tired. I do admit after last week's day elections, we don't know, but it, it's less, less likely. But, you know. but the thing is that there are two big losers at the moment inside the EU who are destroying their industrial base, and that's Italy and France. Uh, they, they, they cannot. So I, I looked at this care carefully. France has exactly the same labor productivity growth rate, unit labor growth growth rate, and everything as Germany. They should, in principle, not be in trouble. Yeah, they went through a painful restructuring in the second half of the 1980s in the early 1990s. Structurally, the country is sort of sound at the microeconomic level. But the, the diabolical logic of these current account diversions that begin to eat each other up. That's what, what screws France in a way. Italy is destroying its entire industrial base by forcing itself with what is going to be a massively overvalued exchange rate. Now these two eventually are going to have to come to terms with your question, is that is it our political will to stay in or is there a sustainability issue here? And I suspect that once you take the probabilities of all these different scenarios and you add them up, you get awfully close to something like 60-70%. So one of them, I, I suspect, is going to be a trigger of something very, very nasty. I think George is sort of saying a similar thing. You, you could, you, you could 
sort of te technocratically imagine some so solutions. Right? But first of all, politically unpalatable because they are often not symmetric or they cost too much or what, what, I, don't, what I love you. But secondly, I'm, I'm not sure that's the best way to go because that, that takes us into the world that Catherine is, is studying. Is that if, I mean, I, they didn't ask me to do all these things and I'm a citizen of, of the EU as well. And there are loads of us who were not asked to do, do all these things in the future to keep EMU alive. So that will feed essentially the fringes, the, the anti-EMU fringes. And that's the, that's the seed, I suspect, of a lot of anti-EU sentiment that is growing at the moment. So even if you were to be, be able to come up with a solution, that would be sort of, you know, your political will. You're never, I mean, it's going to have so many unintended consequences um, at the political level that it might actually be even worse than the world that we are in at the moment. Donny, you want to wrap up? Is there something you would you like to add? You didn't want to speak. No, <laughs> unless I mean, some of it. Okay. Do uh, you have any final uh, comments, questions? Mm -hmm. Everyone's quite tired. So uh, let me thank the speakers. Um, and before I let you go, I would like to make a couple of announcements. First, uh, dinner is served at nine, um, and uh, we also be organized uh, dinner tomorrow. So uh, we have uh, going to take you to the town, to the, to the old town. Uh, it's actually uh, optional, and uh, there's a fee. Uh, it's uh, cost like 25 euros. So if you're interested, please uh, register your interest at the reception. And uh, there's going to be a bus leaving at uh, 8:30. Okay. 8. Yeah, maybe we can leave a bit early so you can also walk around. And uh, finally, uh, to the panelists, please don't forget about the interviews. You can go and have a coffee and then come back. Thank you.